Um, well, of course, we wrestled with this um, uh, in 2007 when we wrote the first version, and again uh, recently. Um, uh, I, you know, for me, the, ma the old maximum of G the GLC of 150 was the maximum permissible density, and all of those schemes that quite commonly are referred to as high density <coughs> were actually no more than the density of Bloomsbury. Um, so that was high density, so we decided to call what we then termed super density, i.e. over 150 and up to sort of about 200, um, uh, super density. We've clarified the thinking, and really, I suppose, if, if anyone's misleading anybody uh, around here, what I'd like to claim is that it's by design. In other words, uh, take a look at the uh, examples in the, um, in the publication when you get hold of a copy and see that the claim we're making is that at superdensity, it's possible to design in such a way that it doesn't feel like an unpleasantly high density. That's the main point. And that above 350, we've concluded it's pretty bloody difficult, and therefore um, you need additional scrutiny um, uh, in, in, in order to decide that you're doing the right thing. Can I just butt in really quickly? I just did a little bit of homework. I don't know how many people know Duquesne Court in Ballum, or how many people know Dolphin Square in Pimlico, both around the 430 dwellings per hectare mark. And I think they're highly livable. I think um, you're touching on a point. We, I can't tell you what a struggle it was to get us all to measure density in the same way. <laughs> There's 12 case, case studies and there was 12 different measurements of it. And one of the, uh, one of the dangers of talking about density and figures is that, is that if you've got a small site with a lot of development on it, it's very high density. If you take into neighbourhood considerations, I bet you'd find that, that you'd come up with a, a different story, uh, a story. We think occupancy needs to be taken into consideration. We'd like some measure around bed spaces, mm -hmm. because I think it a, gives a better reflection of who's living there. There's another point about whether the, how you overlay tenure on top of that, because obviously private sector tends to under-occupy a bit. It, there needs to be a more sophisticated measure or group of measures that deal with that, 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 that deal with the open thing of density and the wide neighbourhood. Matthew, you've just answered Duncan Bowie's question. He's smiling now. Is it, yeah. <laughs> Without the white answer. Someone give a mic to Duncan. There we go. D Duncan Bowie, that was part of my question. University of Westminster and very involved in drafting the original guidance in the London Plan in 2004 and 2008. Um, I mean, I think actually the report should be retitled Against Hyperdensity because that actually gets round the point that kind of Michael Bark was just raising and actually deals with what you're arguing against as well as what you're arguing for, because clearly there's a massive distinction between the kind of 350 dwellings per hectare on Lewisham Gateway and the heading for 3,000 on South Quay. Um, the comment, I mean, Andrew made the comment about uh, the London plan being rigid on density policy. It's a situation where half to two thirds of the schemes given planning consent breach the density policy. I don't know how loose you want it to be. Uh, there is certainly a case for bringing back the original guidance, which was drafted for the original London plan, on the actual mapping of neighbourhood character as well as PTAL and the ranges of densities across London as a whole. Uh, similar, in fact, to what Abercrombie did in 44. But I mean, the, the reason it was dropped was simply because it was seen as getting in the way of maximising units and seen in the way of getting, getting in the way of developer profit. But it was actually has meant that we've driven a coach and horses through the principles of sustainable residential quality. And we're certainly not getting the mix of, of housing, either affordable housing or uh, uh, family size housing, out of hyperdensity schemes. And as you've said, some of the so-called superdensity schemes are struggling at those <coughs> higher ranges of 300 and 400 as well. And the issue of service charges is critical because we're not getting social rents anymore. You're getting high rents anyway. Service charges aren't covered by housing benefit. You're not going to get affordable housing out of hyper density and not much out of super density either. We've got it completely wrong and we need to completely change the policy. Well, not so much change the policy, but actually implement the policy that we wrote in 2004. Great, thanks. <laughs> Duncan, we've got a question from a yeah. woman Woo, at the back. I got a question. Um, I think one question that no one could you, is could actually. You say who you are and where you're from, please? Sorry? Can you say who you are and where you're from? Ah, yeah, sure. I'm Elena Ruiz from Square and Partners. I'm an associate. Um, I'm from Spain, as you can see. <laughs> uh, uh, basically, I think one question I would like to ask to everyone is uh, which can we, for who are we building this new city in London? I think I work in a very high end residential at the moment, a scheme. Um, 
it's really frustrating to see when you go to central London that actually no one from London can mm. actually afford to buy a flat there. Mm. So basically, it's just a, a playground for rich people from Qatar and other countries with quite a lot of money. Therefore, I think one question, uh, I, the Skindine building actually, they were telling me one of the strategies for the cleaning of the facade, it was to clean from inside the flat, but they told me that it was not going to be possible because the people will live in the flat only one week per year. That is crazy. So I think politicians actually should start thinking how to control what is happening there because everyone is being pushed okay. to some three of even further. Thanks. It's very difficult for designers to talk about this, but I'm going to make them do it anyway. Um, <laughs> well, it, it is a very inflammatory subject. We have to be quite careful not to be too farage about it. Um, I think... I mean, I think we've, the, the point's been well made in the, in the talks about designing for diversity and for London's multicultural population and for all incomes and ages. Um, that's not to say that wealthy overseas investors don't have a place in that, and they should. Um, and we're grateful to them. They generate wealth, and a lot of us in this room, whether directly or indirectly, rely on uh, wealthy international people to boost London's economy. And there is nothing wrong with uh, buy to rent, although it does have an effect at a certain scale on the opportunity to, to buy your own home and on rental levels. I think what you're referring to at the end is something that's become known as buy to leave, which is the phenomenon of investing in London property and leaving it empty or perhaps occupying it like a hotel room for a week or two a year. Again, it may not be immoral, but it's certainly uh, actually it's contrary to planning <laughs> policies for, for permanent residents, and it's taking housing stock out of the market. But before we get too excited about it, I've not read anything very concrete or convincing about the, uh, the degree to which that's happening. A lot of it's anecdotal. Having said that, Islington Council has attempted to quantify it, and they are in the process of bringing in a policy to prevent it uh, through Section 106 agreements on new development. And I, sorry, could I just get yep. Andy? But just before I do that, 61% um, of homes in London for market sale are currently sold to investors of any kind. Yeah. So that's quite a lot. <coughs> Andy? I just wanted to make the point that it's not so much uh, who occupies the homes, but the investment policies of some of the uh, overseas investors, which can drive unfortunate solutions in terms of tenure separation rather than integration and can lead to um, uh, the um, isolation, I suppose, of social and affordable housing. Uh, and the other point that I think needs to be made is, 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 is about numbers. I think the GLA and the policy makers are dri driving very hard to get their numbers, but they're going upwards instead of outwards in the sense that uh, num it's, it is it's actually not uh, achieving the, the outcome that we, we, we need, which is an increase in supply, which would drive down costs or would at least stop the rising costs of home? Ben, very quickly. In the uh, very quickly indeed. Uh, join the London Society, um, if you're not already members. Uh, go online uh, and download a copy of uh, Building uh, Greater London, which is a pamphlet I wrote uh, for our theme, uh, Can't Pay, Won't Stay, uh, which is clearly concerned about the, um, the, the problem that you raise. And the next question was... Hi. Hi, I'm June Barnes um, from the Institute for Sustainability. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, Duncan's absolutely right. Secondly, I think that planners are still thinking in terms of heating systems, district heating. In, in old speak, we could do an awful lot more to just make our buildings very easy to keep warm without having to have district heating. So we could take all of that cost both in terms of capital costs and also revenue and give people freedom to heat the homes the, the way they want. But the thing that you've, you've done in the report is say it's neither an argument of building high or building out. Now, we've spent quite a lot of time talking about building high. I'm absolutely convinced there's nothing wrong with building high in certain places, but I do think we have to build out. And the idea that we can suddenly densify, densify the suburbs 
um, in a homogenous way, which would require huge amounts of mm. CPOing, which would be anathema yeah. these days, m leads you to think that some careful use of green belt, with the green belt being moved up further, has to be part of the solution to housing people who want to live in London. Super controversial from Jane. Thank you very much. Can I take one more, one more question and then answer them together, and then we will have to close. Sure, thanks. Uh, Jess Drew from HTA. This is a question partly about management and partly about community. I'm interested in why it is that it's easier to build for mixed tenure at mid-rise than it is for high-rise. And I think that one reason is because very often in high-rise developments, the expectations of private rent tenants are much more to do with perhaps exclusivity and I think that quite often um, I think of course there's a very strong argument for kind of what are called poor doors and things like that measures that reduce service charges for affordable housing tenants but I think what's much less defensible is the fact that very often private rent flats in those high-rise developments are sold to or rented to private renters on the understanding that the explicit understanding that these other people live here these affordable housing tenants but you will never have to meet them that's often actually made quite explicit and what i'm wondering is whether there's a way that design could play a role in reshaping those expectations and reintegrating communities in high-rise mixed tenure developments. So high-rise mixed tenure and green belt. Who wants to go first? The street, Jess. Um, right, thanks, Ben. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll, um, I'll have a go. I, um, one of the um, things about the Brunswick Centre, don't be warned, um, is that it's morphed over time. All, all the housing at the Brunswick Centre originally was leased to Camden, and over the years, through, through right to buy, you've ended up with a mixed, communi a mixed community there. The entrances have been, was, uh, uh, have been secured o over time. Um, but actually, actually, it's a mixed, mixed community, and there is no division on which core you have to live, and it's a, a, a relatively good density. Also, um, um, I think this came out in the original super density report and on the example I showed at the end there, you can, um, in that case, uh, shared ownership was layered uh, below uh, home ownership in that atrium section I showed you and I think there are, there are uh, ways to do that. But actually, you know, we have to, we, we follow, develop a brief in relation to that. There's, there's issues where there is perceived value and uh, I think we have relatively um, little room for manoeuvre. Anybody want to do green belt? Yes, I would. Um, I think, uh, thank you, uh, June, because you, you've usefully widened the discussion. I'm rather hoping our next piece of work actually is going to be about the suburbs. Today isn't about that. It's about super density and hyper density. But what you've illustrated is, is the way that people, the argument gets so polarized. You either believe that everything has to be in tall buildings or everything has to be on brownfield sites. Or, or you're for spreading London and concreting over our green and pleasant land. Actually, you need a combination of all of these things, including carefully managed Greenbelt review. It, it shouldn't be a sacred cow. Cambridge has been quietly getting on and doing exactly that and is building, I think, about 25,000 homes around its perimeter and doing Any, it very effectively. Anybody know what percent of Greater London is Greenbelt inside Greater London? It's 22% which is not a figure known to quite a lot of people. Thank you. We have to wind it up there. Um, these are upstairs. Can I just say one other thing, which is that in 1955, the RIBA ran a day-long symposium on how to do high-rise homes. It's a fantastic read, and this is a, a great start. I think we need a day-long symposium on this very topic. Thank you very much to all our speakers and to all of you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>